Yeah, so a lot of people obviously focus on the stories of reverts to Islam as we've discussed or from Sunni to Shia even to the school of Ahlul Bayt but they don't often uh, know of the challenges, the difficult life experiences, the problems that reverts face and these vary from family issues, uh, issues in marriage, maltreatment, loneliness and there doesn't seem to be a network, at least in, in the West from what I know, for reverts. So the purpose of this workshop is to discuss that, see what we can do as individuals in this room to help develop a network for reverts and maybe understand a bit better about the challenges reverts go through and we will have plenty of time for you guys to all ask questions whether it's to do with Abdul Rauf or Sheikh Noor's uh, reversion stories or about the topic itself so uh, I want to start with uh, Sheikh Noor on this I just want to understand some of the challenges that you face from your family upon um, changing your school of thought coming to Tashayyo and um, you know how, how that experience was and maybe something that could have been different at the time how yeah. people could have helped you more yeah so uh, obviously as I said earlier on I wasn't born <coughs> in Shia so it took me some time and a journey through Allah's blessings <coughs> to embrace the school of thought of Ahl al-Bayt as my way of life so this decision obviously came with some consequences. One of, number one, lack of food to eat. Yeah. So I remember very well, I used to walk on the street and pick up orange and cleaned and eat. Yeah. Yeah. So I always say, you are blessed. Man. You don't know that you are blessed until you lose it. So did your family feel like yeah, because obviously when you decide to take this route from their understanding and their teachings, they need to try whatever they can or they could to expose you to certain hardships so that you can stop for them to get to heaven on the day of Qiyamah. <laughs> for them to be rewarded by Allah. Of course, there's a tradition, we all believe in it, but the interpretation of the tradition varies. Sorry. The Holy Prophet mentioned, convey from me, even if it is a verse that you know. You don't have to be a scholar to convey something. So long as you know that one thing, why not convey, share with others? And Amir al Mumin mentioned this also. For Allah to guide one person through you. Is better for you than whatever sun shines on. So they also have this. Say, look, we don't believe in what you are doing. Some call it kufr. Some call you nudges. I remember some people who look at me, not my color, because they are also blacks. <laughs> <laughs> and they, like cleaning, like in a joke way, kind of, yeah. And I remember very well, I was told by one of my family members. If you take this route, this route, you're gonna starve. You're gonna go through hunger. Because nobody will give you anything. Isn't that what Amir al Mu'min exactly. says? If you choose to love us, Absolutely. be ready for trials. Absolutely. And, and one of the Sheikhs mentioned today, I think Sheikh Kili mentioned, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. So that's number one, you know, hunger. I must put my hand on my chest and confess there was, there were, you know, during those times, there were times I said to myself, why? Why are you stressing yourself? Just leave what this and go with everyone and it's then easy. you go, okay, make life easy. But something keeps pushing me at, on the other side. Not like there was somebody. You know, from my mind, you know, this is a mind work, mind process. So that's <coughs> another one. It wasn't easy because the loneliness he mentioned is another one. Yeah. Lost my friends, man. Yeah. Like friends, we grew up together, we used to study together, we used to, you know, we literally did everything together. Played football together. Everybody started questioning me. They didn't want to know you anymore. They didn't want to know me. So you were Yeah. So in my city, I, I would not say I'm the first year in my city. Because there were two or three before me, but who decided not to live in the city. 
they decided to go to the capital because capital you have good sheer yes. establishment but i will say in my city i'm the first to establish Shia center even currently the center which is this of course it's for allah but i established that yeah but it was very challenging beginning so that's number one you know hunger number two loneliness mm -hmm. number three where do you start where do you start <laughs> this really difficult i always sit with my children and i tell them you need to thank allah what are, what do i mean so i went i studied a little bit in hausa and you know when you studied you boiling you want to share you want to you know you want to change everyone <laughs> mm. so what i would do i came back for holiday i went back for holidays and my cousin i would stay with my cousin because i had nothing i had no place to stay I used, it's a family so i would normally stay with my cousin and people would come to visit me but the intention was they want to change me mm. so uh, friends like my friends mm. and you know the way i speak i shout yeah that's west african kind of thing but after all is unique man it's calm he doesn't like shout i think because i was born here yeah i think <laughs> so the water here man is different <laughs> and the onions you know <laughs> so we would argue with my friends so one night my cousin got angry fed up with me but he said you know i think you need to get out of this place wow already this thing that you are doing i don't lie <laughs> and now you're shouting again giving a sleepless night and i had no place to go so that was also well of course eventually i persuaded him and stayed for some time <coughs> and the last one but not at least challenge okay now i'm here I want to start something like some propagation work or to teach Tablin. with the few people that we managed to bring to the fold. So we hired a small place. It's, it's, a, it's a small room, really. This is in Ghana. This is in Ghana. Small room. But then the news went around. Nobody should give them a place for rental. Wow. For rental. And that's what happened. So we had no place. We were handicapped. So you've been like uh, targeted? Yeah, so don't allow them. Boycott. Uh, they don't threaten your life, nothing, sanction. but boycott. By, uh, sanction if. <laughs> from, uh, from what, what you said, I remember that, that sanction that was given to the Mani Ashim community. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So Share Abu Talib when they were. Will deal with them. Absolutely, deal. absolutely. Yeah. So it was announced they like that. Sense radio station so we decided look the little that we had let's get together someone should go to radio stations and so the radios were also informed because we are minority young mm -hmm. children these are elders but of course today is a different story isn't it alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. so that's alhamdulillah. it alhamdulillah. ah so when i converted i was 17 16 17 yeah yeah 17 i'll say safely 17 yeah no, okay, ah, so that's a good question. Now, Alhamdulillah, yes, now she is. But obviously, it took long for her to, because it wasn't easy at that age. So what I do, I started, of course, with siblings, with some family members, and then eventually, she also came to the fold. Yeah, but it was very difficult. It wasn't easy. Out of interest, can I ask you, how come you think about Fatima as an issue in Sunda school? As a yeah. They have Aisha and everyone. Yeah. So how can you very good. So that's a very good question. So you see, with the Sufis in particular, yeah, they revere Ahlul Bayt. That's why, if you look at globally, I wouldn't say only in Ghana or West Africa, Shias and Sufis have some good relationships intrafaith most of the intrafaith work we do we do with them really so safely to say majority of the sunnis we don't have any problem with them they don't see you as kafir you know as najis yeah sufis yeah normal so and in africa like where i'm coming from when it comes to say the fatima they call it nana fatima 
So Nana is like a, Nana of course is an Ashanti language, Nana. Mm. Nana means king, mm. literally. Or queen. Queen, yeah. Yeah. So for Fatima alayhi salam, you'll say Nana Fatima. So what I did was with my family, close family like my mom and them, because you're not gonna reason too much with them because of their circumstances. So I said, okay, fine. You've been for Hajj several times. You haven't been, but at least you had a lot. Can any one of you here tell me if he has seen where Fatima is buried? Wow. This question you ask anyone, they can't answer. So then, of course, one of them who is like a scholar, he said, no, now you see they taught him philosophy, he's philosophizing. I said, no, it's a simple question. Where is she buried? So now when you narrate that historical background leading to her death, they find it appealing and they cry. Is this what happened? I said, yes, that's what I read in this book and that book and that book. So you are able to connect the dot. And one other thing is that, and you are totally right. Fatima alayhi salam, they will mention, but just in person. So one thing which is really making them realize that, no, these years are not Kafra. I'm talking of the majority Sunnis. Because now we focus more on Fatima, on Imam Ali, on Ahlul Bayt, and Sufis, they always say they are the champions of Ahlul Bayt. But now they realize, look, these people, they are giving us a lot of details when it comes to their lives of Ahlul Bayt Ali, and they find it appealing. But obviously, it needs a lot of patience. It's not that easy, and Tawfiq from Allah also. Yeah, it, it's challenging. Yeah. Mm -hmm. we discussed maybe your challenges from coming from Christianity to Islam. Sure. I mean, obviously, my, my situation is different in the sense that I was born, sorry, born and brought up in London. Uh, but I can relate to what Sheikh says with regards to your friend circle. So, in my case, my friends were non-Muslims. And in fairness, they never really, so I told them, look, I'm becoming a Muslim. And they never, maybe they were uncomfortable with it. Maybe, you know, it, it had an impact on our relationship. But I was the one who started to move away from my friends. Because without going into details, when you have friends, when you're not a Muslim, the things that you get up to, you no longer can do. You know, you go and sit, sit down with a friend who's non-Muslim and you're Muslim and Salah time's coming soon and he's maybe drinking something, whatever. Mm. Yeah, and he, there comes a point where you just naturally move away. They never told me to stop coming. I just stopped going myself. So there now becomes a void in your life because you've detached from those friends and we're social beings. We can't, generally, we don't live alone, right? We need to interact with others. This is where, alhamdulillah, for me, was, I, and that's, inshallah, helped build me, I think, was the fact that Sheikh Bilal had the group there. Mm. And the beauty about that group, I'll never forget it, even though we only used to meet once every two weeks, was that uh, it was the first time that I saw people who looked like me, yeah, any blacks, who had already taken that journey. At mm. that time, I stuff for Allah, thought I was the only person in the whole of the UK had stumbled upon this Islam, Islam or no, Shia she Islam, Islam particularly. Islam. I ran, then found out, no, it wasn't the case. And Alhamdulillah, there as well, I met some white brothers, two of them who are still very good friends of mine. One of them, funny enough, is married to an Iraqi sister. Um, and they became very good friends of mine. So. Most evenings when I was free, one of them lives quite close to me in East London. I would go and spend time with him. I met Chinese brother there. And of course, we met some Pakistanis oh. and some Iraqis there as well. So I was lucky in that at that time, there was a structure already in place whereby I never felt the void of losing my previous friends. I automatically had new friends who also became my mentors. We didn't have an official mentor group, but looking back now these were brothers who two three years had been muslim so they were explaining their own experiences i had somebody to bounce off somebody to seek encouragement from um was it quite easy to let go of those friends would you say it was a natural process was it, your, was, would you it, say was, it was harder on? yeah it was harder to stay with them yeah because it was either i stay with them 
and God forbid fall back into old habits mm. or I had to move on so it wasn't difficult from that point of view because obviously I'd, I'd taken this choice yeah. um, and I would say that the other main challenge I found was marriage of course marriage is one of those really uh, tricky topics that uh, of course we were discussing earlier yeah when you become a revert and let's be frank particularly a black person becoming a revert trying to find somebody to marry is very difficult i converted as i said in 1994 i didn't get married until 2007 wow. Oh, wow. and i was 23 when i converted to islam oh. so and in the end Subhanallah, my wife is not here, she's, down, she's here in the conference. So I have to say this anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody recorded it. But it was, no, seriously, it was the best choice I could have made in my life. Wow. Because, you know, if some, there's not many Pakistanis here, in fact, I can't see any Pakistanis. Yeah, yeah. there's one or two. Okay. I can't say it, forgive me. Ah, sorry, sorry. But, you know, as part of the culture in the UK, if you're Pakistani or Indian, there's always that possibility that when you want to get married, if you can't find somebody here, you go back to Pakistan. As a Nigerian, born here, it's not really something you hear. I do not know of many Nigerians who have gone back home to get married. But it got to a stage where I was like, you know what, I'm in my 30s, I've not found somebody. I want, like my friends, to get married and have children and call my son Muhammad Ali, alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. My son now called Muhammad Ali. How is that going to happen? Maybe I should go to Nigeria. Mm. There's going to be a cultural gap between my wife, potentially, because yeah. I'm an English boy. Trump. They call me a coconut. You know, <laughs> like, yeah. All of these different things were worrying me. But alhamdulillah, the year before I did go back home, I was happy, uh, lucky enough to go for Hajj. Mashallah. And pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at the Kaaba at, uh, in Medina at the Dariq <coughs> of the Holy Prophet peace and blessings be upon him and his holy progeny and I went and luckily for me because of my trips to Iran I knew two sheikhs who had gone back to Nigeria so through them I was able to say listen I'm coming do you know of any sisters and that's how I got married I, I would say that marriage is definitely a, a challenge so for example sheikh is talking about um, his children, I also have children. My children are not reverts. They were born Muslim. Mashallah. His name is Muhammad Ali, Zahra and Zainab. Mashallah. But, Mashallah. But, Mashallah. but it is always in the back of my mind that what happens when Muhammad Ali comes of age mm. and wants to get married? Of course, inshallah, times are changing. Inshallah. The challenges I had, maybe he wouldn't face. But Sheikh <coughs> is my witness. Every time I see Sheikh, in fact, just downstairs. Yeah. This is my, my last point, and then we move on. Sheikh, I see his children. We know each other's families. My wife knows his fa his wife. He says to me, "Okay, this is my daughter Khadija." I'm like, "Okay, how old is she?" Or no, how how old is the, what's the name of your 16 year old? Yeah, Zainab. Zainab. So I asked him, "How old is she?" He said, "16." In my mind, I went like this, Muhammad Ali is only 14. <laughs> <laughs> when he goes to me, ah, this is Khadija. I said, how old is she? She said, you said 12. 11. 11. Yeah. I said, Sorry. perfect. Sorry. 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 <laughs> yeah, no, let's, let's do the deed now. Check it now. Everybody can see. But the one of the reasons why I do this is because I'm, I'm worried about the potential of yeah. my son and daughters yeah. finding somebody in the future. So yeah. as a last point, I would say that one of the biggest challenges of reverts particularly black reverts is marriage. Do you find that, and you know, it's sad to say this, especially in 2022, do you think racism still plays a big role in this? I know Sheikh touched upon this a couple of years ago in that lecture, you remember Sheikh now? Right? We'll talk <laughs> about it in a second. Forget? How can we forget I that one? Forget. He was there, but, I was yeah. there yeah. but do you think that's uh, a lot of our community, even those who've been raised in the UK, still have these racist tendencies in them or colonial sort of tendencies in them? Yeah, I don't know. I, I, I think it's harsh to say racism. I think a lot of it is baggage from our backgrounds. I think Iraqi culture, for example, somebody marrying from, say, Baghdad, marrying somebody from Nasiriya, <laughs> is a big problem. Yeah. Talk less of somebody from a totally different country. Mm, mm, so mm, I think mm. that is a, 
an issue. Yeah. I, I think one of it is the cultural issues. Cultural issues. Yeah, yeah, cultural. And this is unfortunately still there. But I think, for, I think people born in the UK, for British Muslims or American Muslims, why would that matter? Because you've been raised in the same country. No, I think country. Part, it, it's got mm. to do with... I think it's partly to do, listen, we're all, alhamdulillah, followers of Ahlul Bayt, alayhi wa yeah. So I think that is the unifying factor. I think the fact that we're all here in the UK means that even our children's culture, my children's culture, your children's culture may have a lot more in common than yeah. than anything That's else. True. I think also as well, which is a really important point with regards to these children, is that obviously the way they think is different to to us as well. Um, but yeah, it's 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 a, it's a difficult one. Have you yourself? I know again, I don't want to use the word racism per se. Have you yourself experienced this kind of bias? Because I mean, <laughs> usually like when when a Muslim who was born Muslim, sees a black guy, probably say, oh, you must be called Bilal, right? That sort of thing. <laughs> oh, when you come into a mosque, everybody's staring at you. you know no, I, mean? I, don't get, I don't get, you must be called Bilal, but I do get, you yeah. know, the Mu'addin of the Prophet was Bilal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Which, alhamdulillah, we know, and it's good. And I know their, their intention is, is good, but obviously it goes a, a lot further than that. I remember one president of a Jama'at. Thank you. I remember one president of a Jama'at in the UK. I won't specify the city or the ethnic background of that Jama'at. Alhamdulillah, we had a good relationship. So one day, we were in, on Ziara together, and he calls me over. He was with some family members from a different part of the world. So he goes, Abdurraouf, come, come, come. Meet my family. So then he introduces me to them. He says, this is Rauf, my son. But he will never be my son-in-law. <laughs> oh no way! <laughs> wow, he said that. <laughs> so, yeah, these these types of things are, are said. But what I would say is, and some of the reverts tell me, "Oh, you're lucky because you're on TV. People know you." <laughs> and that's not true because I have been frequenting centres long before and the base TV was around. Khoja centres, Pakistani centres. Iraqi centers and I can safely say that I haven't suffered any racism however from what I hear on the sister side I hear it's a lot worse even in our own center some of the brothers there and alhamdulillah we are from a center in London which has East African blacks East African Khoja some Iraqi families some Iranian families some from Bangladeshi families some Somali families, yeah, I mean, we are a mixed bunch. Alhamdulillah. And on the men's side, we don't really have any issues. Yeah, sometimes the food, okay, it's a bit too hot. You know, maybe I can't eat Pakistani, <laughs> but we don't have any problem on the brother's side. Alhamdulillah. But unfortunately, we hear stories from time to time on the sister side along racial lines. So these are some of the <laughs> challenges out there. You've both discussed some of the main challenges and you've given some personal experiences. Now, the crux of the matter is, what do we do now? There's many people coming to Islam. Islam is the fastest growing religion. And I would say the school of Ahlul Bayt is growing more than ever. I see all Absolutely. around the world when we travel, share different sure. countries. What can we do to address some of these problems? Uh, mm. And again, we'll later take it to the floor, to the audience to get involved. Yeah. Um, would you like yeah. to start? Before, before you go there, I just want to add one or two other challenges that the rivets or the converts go through within our communities sure. yeah and of course as you mentioned habibi khan aim for this discussion is to go out with something pragmatic to try to bring about positive changes in our communities and going forward because things are evolving and we are living in a very dynamic world and the theme of this convention is how to practically prepare for the reappearance of our beloved 12 female. So one obviously is marriage, which Aja Abdul Rauf fully covered. If you interact with the rivers, one of the biggest headache they have at the back of their mind is marriage. Because they've left their old life now they have taken new life. Where they are coming from, not all accept them. 
So they have challenge there. Now this new place that they are in, thinking that everything will be okay because they read about Islam, they thought his holistic way of life is everything. They read the life of the Holy Prophet. Yes, as Abdul Aja Prophet mentioned, some of it are culture. But if culture clashes with the religion, we need to swallow that bitter pulse and follow the religion for the sake of our Qiyamah. It's not easy. It's only men, real men and women who will do that, not everyone who calls himself a Muslim or a Shia. So, marriage one. Number two is spiritual abuse. Spiritual abuse. This one, women go through it more than men. And I'm talking of women who are convert or reverts. This is a reality. You can make your own, you know, research on this. <coughs> you know, they will not have anything to do with this lady who is a revert or convert. Mm -hmm. But they will propose mother. Yeah. Yes. Or second wife, third wife. Or second wife. Oh, no, let's just hang around, you yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. But let us be very comfortable. Yeah. It's spiritual abuse. It's there. That's why you see, you hardly see revert anymore coming together and doing things together. Yes, they go to the centers, they come for their program, but... So spiritual abuse, I believe, is a challenge. Yeah. It's a challenge. Yes. Yeah. I think you look at it from... I don't disagree with you, but I think this is when I came in from Iraq yeah. many years ago, um, I faced the same problem. Mm. It's not just because of race or something, because the options are very limited. You are not known to hear. People are very uh, restrictive with the options. So yeah. I, cha I had the same challenge of my brother here. So it's not just you. The, we all uh, stay in the same boat. That's one. So. I, when I get married, I, me and my wife, we try to <coughs> have uh, this kind of small organization to help people to get married. Uh, so you can do this as part of your job. Solutions. Prophet Muhammad was interested in the marriage of yeah. many Sahaba at that time. So I think that's probably you need to think about it. And yeah, no, no. So we are all matchmakers. We'll come to the solutions. And we do a lot of matchmaking, by the way. Yeah, we'll come to the solutions. But these are challenges. If you sit with the rivet and talk to them, they are normally they are not welcomed at centers. Mm. But when it involves spiritual abuse, you'll find that particular person, that particular welcome. Yeah. So this is something really we need to. Hajj of the Roof mentioned that there was a Sheikh Bilal was leading an initiative for reverts. Like, how many of these sort of initiatives do you know? I know you're here at Mahfil Abbas in Birmingham. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's people in this room from all over the UK. Yeah. How many of these initiatives are going on? Couldn't we have like a, a, a national drive behind this that we can have these things every month happening so reverts can have a place to go talk with other people? So we've started something, but it is at an infancy stage to help the revert and the converts to get married easily. Well, that's a challenge. I, I'm not going to sit here and mention them. If I mention certain names, you'll do ha. Ah. Well, lie some prominent figures, not because they didn't want to get married, by the way. It's because of this type of a situation. Mm. And now they made their mind, I'm not, okay, fine, that's, I'm not going to get any money. If you have good ones. Those, no, they say, you know what, I'm going to get whoever I get, whatever, whether I'm Muslim or Muslim, I don't bother, I'm going to get married. So, initiative, Sheikh Bilal, very prominent personality. Yeah. We've started something small, Aj Abdurov knows about it, it has not yielded any result. It's at, at emphasis, it. myself, Sheikh Ayub, Sheikh Zakaria, you know, Sheikh and Hanif. Sheikh Ahmed Hanif, we started something which, inshallah, is that something social that they can get together? Or no, no, yeah, yeah something, yeah, very, yeah, it's going to be very strong and social. We only pray, inshallah, Allah help us. Inshallah. But later on, when we look at the solutions, we can come up with uh, this. The third one, other challenge is what? Ill treatment. Yeah. Ill treatment in what way? Apart from Hajj Abdurrahof Center. That's, I always tell Shaq Ayub, this is the best center I've seen in the UK. Yeah. Which is that? MC. MC. East London. East London. <coughs> Amazing. You'll find Iraqis, Pakistanis, Khojas. So, everyone is there. You know. It's the United Nations. It's United Nations. <laughs> Literally. Literally. When you go to recite Majlis, the feeling is unbelievable. 
But apart from this particular center, yeah. every center reverts go. They don't find it comfortable. Mm. So that's why I term it ill treatment. Why ill treatment? Because, you know, a convert is coming with some culture or baggage, if you like, from where he or she coming from. So you don't expect the person to understand your internal policies and what is happening in your own community. So sometimes they will behave, I will not call it a bad way really, maybe in your own way and culture you think is a bad way. But that's how they are, that's where they are coming from. But people failing to understand them or maybe they are genuine in their ignorance, I don't know. They tend to ill-treat. i give you a typical example. <coughs> There's a gentleman, you know, he's a British, but black from Caribbean, if you like, but born and bred here. Yeah. He got married to one of our girls. You know, when I say one of our, one of our community girls. I was involved. I did the marriage sometime two years ago. But this, he, I never saw him at the center. The mosque. Obviously, I'm always in front, <laughs> sitting on the member release. I don't know what's happening out. <laughs> so you could see everybody who's attending. Yeah, but I could see, but I, I don't know how people are treated, how people yeah. are handled, you know. So recently, really, some few months ago, they invited me for something. So I was, I said, I'm really sorry, man. I've not been checking on you. I've not seen you for some time. COVID is over. I thought you'll be coming. He said, no, I won't come. They said, no. Wow. Why? He said, no, 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 no. They're not treating me well, man. Then he said, look, Shaq, me, I decided to become Muslim. My parents are not Muslims. They are not even happy because they are Orthodox. But when I come, at least I want somebody to say, welcome, how are you, sit here? Mm. Sometimes there's a lot, I don't know how to do it properly. Some people are laughing at me. Yeah. That's why I stopped. Then I, I showed him, I said, please, please, please come. You know, but you know this. It takes time. Yeah, and then of course, last but not least, then you want to say, loneliness. Loneliness. Yeah. Well done. Yeah. Was the, the language barrier one of the challenges? Like, for example, going to a certain mosque and that yeah. in, in a particular language, but not in. Uh, yeah. So you know that 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 definitely is, is is a good point. But if you look at today, most of our centers we speak in English. People, even you know, I give an example. You know, our center Husseinia, Husseinia, Mafela, Mu Mafela Bas, I be small hit. Ah, Santum. So there is this. Uh, we have few reverts who go there. But there's one particular, Mikael. He does matam in Urdu, but he doesn't understand Urdu. Wow. He loves it. So one day I ask him why he said, you know what, they treat me well, Shaq. Oh, there you go. He's always with them. He go with this, uh, they, when they go to Bradford to recite he's with them. They go this place to recite with them. Why? Because they are treated. He doesn't understand. I ask him, do you understand? Or do he said, I have no pollution. <laughs> Only what I know. Bah, 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 bah. Bah, bah, wow, bah, bah, wow, bah, wow, bah, wow. Bah. How do you say? That's, I said, but how? He said, no, I feel good. They energize me. So, it's, you know, they welcome in. You know, when you go to some churches, you know, somebody will be standing by the door. Welcome, how are you? Can I offer you a cup of tea, for example? Most of our Muslim centers, we don't have. Mm -hmm. So that loneliness kills the river. Yeah, these are some of the challenges I want to, but you have a... Yeah, I think... Uh, I want, want to say something. I want Abdul wants to say something before we go into solutions, I think. Okay, yeah, because there's a couple of hands up. Yeah. Um, I can speak... Of course, when you become, at least from my perspective, of, when you become a Muslim follower of Ahlul Bayt, I don't think anything should deter you from that path. Of course, yeah. it's the path, inshallah, that you take to your grave. Inshallah. But just touching on what Sheikh, uh, Sheikh Noor mentioned about the mosque and how brothers feel, and sisters as well particularly, I, I can say categorically that a lot of people, unfortunately, Iman has suffered because they don't go to the mosque. Yeah. Ramadan comes, Layal yeah. al-Qadr yeah. comes, the, the, the nights of Ashura come, they've decided like Sheikh said about this particular individual he brought it to mind you ask them brother what's going on you know I go to all of these in London as you know many of us 
no, we don't stick to one center. Like this Muharram, alhamdulillah, some nights we were able to catch three majalis. MashaAllah. And I don't see, which is one of the sad things for me, I don't see many, and I know there are many brothers out there and sisters out there who are black and white and Chinese. Who are? Chinese, Shia yeah. Ethna Ashra, yes. Very good friend of ours. Uh, they don't come. And when you ask them why they don't come, they, they say things like this, oh, the mosque, they don't treat us right, they look at us funny, this, that, and the other. I was, I'm one of those people who was stubborn from the beginning. So the more you treat me funny, the more I'm going to come. <laughs> and in fairness to those centers, in fairness to them, because you were asking about English language, just very quickly, the Khodja centers were the first in the UK to actually implement English. English, yeah. mashallah. Particularly Haidari and uh, Stanmore. Stanmore yeah. So I used to go there mostly. But before then, because I've been Muslim that long, there were not many majalis in English. Mm. So I would go to the Urdu centers and I would sit there. <coughs> and what would happen, and I can't blame them because obviously they weren't used to it. So you'd be sitting there and then they'd be like, in the majlis, member is that way, but they're like. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember one particular majlis, and I'll never forget this. My Urdu, I don't speak Urdu, but I'll never forget this statement. Because I was in the majlis once, everybody's lis listening to the Maulana speak, and then suddenly everybody starts turning around and looking at me. Why? What happened? <laughs> I'm used to one or two people, and then when I look at them, they no. look away. Now everyone is looking at me. Apparently on the member, the Maulana said, Dar mi kuch kala hai. Oh. What, does what does that mean? It means that there's something... Yeah, there's something... What? Say it again in Urdu. Dar mi kuch kala hai. Okay. Which means there's something black in the lentils. But in fairness to the Maulana... Maybe he's saying something. He says a phrase. It means something dodgy is going on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's something fishy going on. <laughs> but... I think the it's a local, local saying. It's a local saying, but unfortunately, the the people who are listening just related that to well, there's only one. So I never forget that statement. So yeah, that's basically the the situation. If we can have more, I don't know how we do it. To be honest, the way the centres are, and again, we go to different centres: Iranian, Iraqi, uh, Pakistani, Khoja, Khoja centres. I don't know how we bring this into our centers where if there's an ambassador who's there to try and make these new people feel welcome, then that would be easier. I don't know. I know there's a couple of other reverts in the room. It'd be maybe good to hear from we're, them as we're well. We're lacking in time, so I want you to both quickly go on solutions. And, if and then we can go to them. Yeah. yeah. If you want to quickly get solution to the solutions problems at hand. Solutions, I, I'll let Sheikh know. I don't know how okay. much you want to mention now with regards to... Okay. Plan with regards to the, the, the marriage, oh, okay, okay. Uh, because obviously that's that's as I said one of the biggest challenges. Mm -hmm. um, something like Sheikh Bilal's initiative back in the day, I don't know. Mm. It was it was for a specific time, and there were mashallah at, at the time in the early nineties, so many brothers and sisters. I don't know if it's because of the political situation as well, what was happening in Iraq. There was just many of us that were happening to be congregate around Islam and so we were able to formulate this family I don't know if those types of places mm. can be uh, rejuvenated. rejuvenated thank you I, I'm not sure because to be honest with you if it wasn't for Sheikh Bilal's place at that time I honestly don't know where, yeah, where I'd be today Allah so I think it was I think it's really important. <coughs> and I think, you know, we try. Sometimes when we go to a mosque and we see a new face, oh, brother, mashallah, you're new. Oh, you're Muslim. Oh, you, you just converted. Uh, you know, I take his number. But again, it's not like back in the day when we were younger mm. and we weren't yeah, married. Easy now. We could hang out and go to Edgeway Road and smoke a shisha. <laughs> you know, we, we don't have the time anymore. Edgeway. We have family. And so, I don't know. There's a, yeah. there's a, a lot of things that can be done. No, quickly, you know, obviously there are lighter solutions and there are ma major solutions, so minor and major solutions. And this yeah. is for everybody in this room? To yeah, this is for all of us, yeah. Well. Can I just say that it's not just about marriage, like, you know we touched on loneliness and isolation. Yes, yes, absolutely. You really need to do something. No, no, definitely, I agree. I'm, I know, you know, I'm yeah, she's been speaking about it, yeah. I know, we are in touch with somebody, in fact, through her, I got to know this young lady. It's, you know, it's too much, man, too much. She has one child. You know, like you said, you don't feel welcome, and I 
we need to do a lot more. I don't I know agree. what we can do, but we need to do a lot more. We can't just sit there. Yeah. And, you know, like uh, some people, it just put them off. True. Yeah. I think I think they could just go back. Yeah, yeah. yeah. In very fact, easily. My friend told me some people they weren't uh, they didn't come to uh, the school of Ahlul Bayt, but they were Sunni. They went back. They became mm. Sunni. They went back. Yeah. And so I don't think as a community we do enough. That's my. Yeah. So I think uh, look, uh, this is a big agenda. Mm. It needs collective efforts. Individually, also, we can play some parts by talking, by creating awareness to begin with, yeah? So there was a, this survey which Muslim Vibe one time shared. It's yeah. been a while. So I, one thing really, you know, attracted my attention on that survey. That look on the lighter note, most of these people, they don't want to be called revert and converts. They say call them Muslims this year. Yeah. That's on a lighter note. Because once you say revert, convert, you have... Different. Ah, you've labeled them. So we need to avoid labeling. That I found it really interesting and intriguing. So that on a lighter note, all of us, we need to try. You know, it's challenging, but we need to try. That's number one. Number two... Organization like Mainstay Foundation yeah. can take this as one of their projects towards preparing for the reappearance of Imam. Same. What do we do? It needs proper studies. It needs some research, some surveys to be conducted. How many rivers do we have? How many are coming? I can tell you some of the Sunni organizations have some unbelievable... Massive. Massive. Even massive. here, I'm talking of Birmingham because I live here. Not far from us here, small heat and the rest. They are having some <coughs> amazing project and program for them. That's why they are able to sustain, to maintain most of the people coming They're to their fold. They're actually giving that one. Yeah. That's the and we are unable to to, 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 to maintain. Yeah? I have a point, and that is that, that when we see, when we, we see different companies, the, how the, the company is performing, it depends much on the leadership. Yes. The leadership yeah. It, uh, it their character, the, the way they want to manage, I mean, that trickles down to yeah. the employees. Yeah. In our centers, for example, like uh, the, the leadership, they may need to be uh, like, uh, like they, need, they may need to be updated and, and uh, doing courses, for example, and uh, know the challenges. and. Uh, not following the culture's only approach as uh, yeah no no definitely so in, in a lot of, just one more yeah. there's, there's a lot of focus on rit only rituals but not an understanding or knowledge absolutely so no, that's wants to make a point on the yeah over there. yeah let so just like to say one thing uh, I think a lot of people must think they pushed away because of like a, a spiritual superiority, superiority complex. Like I feel like some people, they, they, um, they make themselves, they make other, people, other people feel inferior almost. Mm -hmm. I think that makes a lot of people almost run away. But like, I'll give you an If you go to any Sunday mosque that I've been to, I'm sure you don't see Any time I go to pray, just hop in. If they don't know you, everyone's missing you. Everyone's yeah. Like, yeah. That one, that one. They don't that know one. who you are. That one, that one. Yeah, yeah. solid. You go to some centers, MC is a, is a good example because everyone they almost they make it a job to almost bring you in. Mm. I think Ralph can agree with that. But if you go to other centers, I almost feel like they're looking. They the way they look at you. I wouldn't say it's great or anything, but it's like then it's not very not very welcome. I would say it's almost like you, judgmental. You feel yeah. it's, it's like you invaded their uh, private yeah, space. Exactly. Mm. So it makes I think like it pushes people in A A and A stuff, and it feels people like why am I bothering with this? If they're not gonna welcome me. Yeah. I feel that and I'm not even a reason. There you yeah. go. Yeah. Exactly. Absolutely. Yeah, when you go to others and I totally agree. Yeah. Same so how they feel Just true. Yeah. yeah, so I think the solutions, as I mentioned, look, mainstay need to take this as a project. Yeah. Conduct some survey, conduct some studies, and then come up with some pragmatic solutions. But one of the solutions is that, obviously, not all leaders are here, but our centers need to have support service or support structure. I remember very well here at Alabas we used to have but it's normal. So we had meetings. We had a meeting like two weeks ago. We're going to revive that. We had this 
revert subcommittee. Mm. So they are task. Whoever comes new, welcome the person, let the person settle well. Yeah. Like the way when freshies come from wherever they are coming for their studies. Although freshies, I gave a lecture and I destroyed it completely. Some didn't like it, but I'm using it again today. <laughs> so, you know, we have how they settle the students who are coming from East Africa in our community. Settle well, you studying at UOB or Aston or wherever you study in. They make you settle properly, by the yeah. way. So, the same thing, we need that support. So, of course, I represent a community here. And I can confidently say, inshallah, we'll implement this in my community as soon. But it needs to be done in every community. Yeah, so that's why I say mainstay needs to, take it, need yeah. to do something. Sure. And of course, regarding marriage, obviously, as Rantimesh, it's not only about marriage. It's, every, it's holistic. Social. But regarding marriage, we started something. Ajab Abdurov was there in the first meeting we had, and a few others. It is to try to mitigate this challenge, yeah. yeah. So that we make our children feel at home also, you know. Exactly. So because of the experience of matchmaking we've been doing for about five, six years now. So we want to replicate that. And inshallah, if Main State takes this as a project, we can still discuss with them and have a conversation. But it needs someone to take this to very seriously. The sister, I think, had a first, sorry. Yes. Yeah, please. Okay, okay. I think Richard earlier, I think the importance of the social element for um, the reverts. Um, my question is, how would we kind of tackle that in some areas where it's not as big as a Muslim centre with a lot less resources? Because where I'm from with Brighton, it's, it's, we have a centre, but the resources are not big, and the, 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 the attendance is quite low. Um, so it's kind of a different equation because now we're talking about pitching, you know, loads and little Muslims in the area enough to even have a single other revert. Mm -hmm. If there was one revert, there's no, there's no other in the area. Um, to how question the question I would pose is, how can we kind of have the social element to it? In, in the smaller, as in, I think the example you gave is very, very lovely and idealistic. If we could have these these big sessions with lots of new from the same background, um, just how to implement these across these smaller Muslim populations where we're no. not big capitals. Mm. I agree. It's logistically, it's a nightmare. Even I keep going back to Sheikh, Sheikh Bilal. That wasn't easy. That's why it was every other week, by the way, because mm. London. For those of you who live in London know that's a massive place. I live in East London, somebody else lives in South or somebody else lives in Croydon. Uh, yeah, and he, even when we've tried to arrange, we had uh, uh, a debate revert community, ARC. But even when we tried to arrange programs, we tried to do it once every two months. And even then, mm. the numbers were relatively low. Mm. So again, going back to the point that Sheikh Noor made, maybe it's a case of an organization be it mainstay or somebody else just having some sort of hub i don't know whether it's some sort of virtual place where people could go to uh, frequently ask questions or something or maybe once every six months have a conference yeah. somewhere in the center birmingham where reverts of course when we say reverts it doesn't mean yeah. you know, none of you can come but you know where reverts and like-minded people can can gather and and we look at ways of trying to strengthen the structures to make that journey easier for new readers. So, so, so you want to ask your question? Yes, I think um, all what you touched upon is really important. But I think the source of all of this is fear. I think it's natural to fear the new, like yeah. every one of us would fear something new or something yeah. new. And I think it's very important to address that fear in our communities. I'm, I'm, I'm born Muslim and I'm born Shia, but and I see it, I'm from Iraq, and I see it in our community. We, we fear the new, we, we we don't know about people, we don't know about others. We know about the Iraqi Shia community, sometimes even from this city or that city. Yeah. We don't know a lot about others. And I think communication is very important. And to address it in our um, in Shahar Ramadan. Yeah. Exactly, because mm. this is a real, yani it's, a, it's a subject of now. True. Sometimes we, we deal with our Majalis. We talk about history, which is very important, but I think it's important yeah. to also bring the current issues, like social issues, current yeah. issues, yeah. And maybe Muharram, for example. And we have so many ayat and hadith that we can base that on. So we have to keep. Yeah, keep, 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 keep knocking the doors. In everyone in the Asante, mashallah. It's like a question as well. I think a lot of people. Like sometimes when, when I like when they were teaching, I was born Shia, but a lot of people when they come up to me, it's like 
Some of them, they don't think I even know what I'm doing. I don't see myself. <laughs> <laughs> you must have got that watch, yeah. And, and, I had this guy. <laughs> and, uh, so, uh, but the way they make it seem as if Africans or even East Africans particularly, we're not new to Islam. Yeah, exactly. yeah true. The, the first expedition out of uh, Mecca uh, and even, uh, even in that area was to Abyssinia. Yeah. So Muslims have been in East Africa for a long time. True. Yeah. So when they make it seem like Africans are new to Islam, <coughs> I feel like, honestly, it's, like it's, it's not a new thing, so it, exactly, it is ignorance. Like you said, because you think of, because like some people, they think, oh, Africans were the last ones to basically become Muslim. Who was Bilal then, if that was the case? Exactly. <laughs> and so it makes us think... But then we have, we have, sorry to, to, to butt in there, we have, and of course it's, it's changed. I, well, in my experience it's changed, in that the types of conversations I used to have 15, 20 years ago, I no longer have. Now, people won't necessarily come to me now and say, uh, you know, the, the types of what I would consider then condescending conversations mm -hmm. that they, you would have with a river. I remember once I went to Morocco, of all places, to buy uh, Quran. And the guy refused to believe that <laughs> I was a Muslim. He thought I was a football player. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't done with that. And I wasn't, it wasn't like, I wasn't dressed like, you know, with chains or like a big watch or anything. I was just dressed normal. I had to recite Surah Al Fatiha for him before he told it to me. So I get where you're coming from, Ali. I do understand that. But I think people in this room, people in this particular conference, I think it's partly maybe, you know, us educating them as well. For example, yeah. you know, when somebody would say to me that uh, Bilal, oh, you're black, mashallah, and Bilal was also black and he was the Mu'adhin of the Prophet, you know, I would politely <coughs> say to them as well, yes, but do you know that he had other companions who were also black? Yes. He wasn't the only one. So yeah. there's ways that maybe we can educate others that, yeah. you know, we're not, so, we don't need to be spoon fed, stuff for that. We're all, we're all learning. But maybe, you know, the level of the conversation that people need to have with us is on a slightly higher level than what they thought before. Asant. Has anybody else got any questions? Yeah, but, uh, I wanted to ask, um, I mean, there's different types of reverse and um, um, different backgrounds and so forth, but this question is particularly to the black community. Do you think that, as Shias, we hide a lot of the black history that is involved around the ethnic bit, specifically the Aimma? who have married black women from Africa, or, you know, from, from the Islam, good. and for, uh, until the end. And even some would argue that there's a strong narration that the Imam of our time, is of a Nubian mother. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. if the black community were more exposed to this, maybe they would feel more easier and more of a connection towards the Shia community. And maybe we could use the African community as a source of pride rather than you know, who are these guys doing to our mosques? Yeah. Sheikh, you tell an Iraqi that Imam al-Jawad was black, what reaction do you get? It depends on that, the Iraqi. We have some good Iraqis. And <laughs> <laughs> also Iranians. And Iranians. Iranians. Yeah, yeah. 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 But, but, white. Yeah. Uh, but to, to, to answer that particular question, if you were to ask me, I would say no. And what I mean by that is, for me, and I would hope for anybody in this room, or in any other room, if you told me that the Imams were Chinese or purple mm. Mm. or yellow. yellow and purple, yeah. Yeah. it really wouldn't make a difference. Absolutely. Yeah. So, the, so I think if the, the fact that from I think Imam Sadiq salam, onwards the, the yeah. Imam's mothers came from Africa, I wouldn't even call it a source of pride for somebody like me. Maybe sometimes I do ask myself, mm, how does somebody from Iran who does the portrait, or somebody from Iraq. I don't know if you know, you, I'm sure you came across the article that Sister Amina Indos yes. Uh, yes. wrote on this particular, yes. and then she superimposed. Percentages. Yeah, yeah no, but she actually had some images. Yeah. yeah. And I she did it that. anonymously yeah. online, and the amount of abuse that she got based on that, yeah, and it was, so the question would be more like, I wonder how everybody else will react if Imam 
comes, when Imam comes, Inshallah. and he's not as they perceive him to be. Sahih. You know, the same way that the Christians expect Isa to be blue blonde blue hair, blue yeah. eyes, although they don't normally have blonde hair, by the way. They're normally, <laughs> like, Sid is not normally the typical kind of hair color you'd see in this country. It's kind of a mousy brown color. Yeah. But the point is, everybody pro 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 projects their own image on these saintly figures. True. So that's more a question, I guess, that we have to ask ourselves. But yeah, no, for me personally, and I'm not sure I personally would be using that as a as a way. No, 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 definitely, to definitely. Join the it's about the definitely. You know, uh, like uh, I agree with what Haj Abdurov has uh, just said. But you know, within our communities globally, there are people they don't want to hear even Al Bayt. Okay. They tell him to wrap it up. Okay, had anything to do with anyone black, yeah. by the way. Yeah, there are people like that. Otherwise, we do have a lot of black people who know about this thing. They read, they understand it. When you start to share sometimes, people tend to think that, no, you're becoming too much. Why are you even sharing this with us? We don't need it. Yeah. You know, when you start sharing, telling them, look, let's be equal. Let's do things together. Yeah, definitely we have a lot to do. We have a lot to learn from some Christians. We have a lot to learn from some Sunnis. Because, you know, I do a lot of interfaith and intrafaith work. I visit a lot of organizations, yeah, locally and internationally. I think we have a lot to do. <laughs>